My name is Nalette Broadnax, and I'm a political scientist and assistant professor in the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University. And what role does data science play in your career? Well, I am also a data scientist, and I teach data science in the McCourt School. Um, We have a data science master's degree program, and there um, I teach the machine learning sequence. Can you talk a little bit about that program before we get into our main topic? I'd just love to hear about, you know, what's appealing to students and uh, where they get off to afterwards, maybe. Absolutely. So um, our master's program in data science for public policy started about four years ago. Um, It's really designed for students who want to have an impact in either in government or in the nonprofit space. And so while we cover all of the same technical components of machine learning, statistics, and so forth, there's also a a special focus on public policy, the policymaking process, economics. And so it really goes into the domain expertise that they need to be able to use data science appropriately and ethically and having an impact in government and nonprofit. Well, it seems like a really good intersection then. Yeah, we've had students go lots of different places, government agencies, the U.S. Digital Service, various corporations. Also, our postdocs have gone on to places like Twitter and Facebook or Meta, I guess we need to say now. So so it's a mix. Some, some go into industry, um, many go into government and nonprofit organizations. Well, very cool. It's good to hear that there's data science in all these sectors, especially nonprofits, where uh, certainly there's a demand and a need, but not always a supply. Right, right. Well, along those lines, um, something that I guess any sector could look into it, but is especially interesting for culture and society and government and these sorts of things is to do a little bit of monitoring of what's going on with elections, making sure uh, we understand the process and that people are getting informed and things like that. Could you talk a little bit about the lead up to the paper we're going to talk about? How did you get interested in this topic? Sure. So we are generally interested in the impacts of social media on society, um, and more specifically, uh, digital advertising and how that influences society. And a lot of the work looking at digital advertising focuses on the impacts on users. And we wanted to understand, well, how does digital advertising influence politics and how does it influence campaigns? We have some some pretty good knowledge on how individual users respond to digital ads. And we wanted to specifically look at how are political campaigns using digital advertising now that it has really become so prominent and, and how, um, how is that different from the ways that campaigns used to engage with potential voters? And that's how we got interested in this particular paper. Well, it wasn't that long ago when there really weren't any digital advertising offerings. What did political advertising look like then? So we're looking specifically at uh, presidential races, and they bought ads on television. It's really a different environment because you have different kinds of markets. The television advertising space is broken into regional segments called DMAs. And so you could do some general targeting and you could you know, target a particular kind uh, particular as part of the United States. But the ads were very expensive and you didn't have the kind of very fine grain micro targeting that you get with digital ads. So that's a really big change. Uh, and also the television audience would tend to be different, right? So an, an older population where on the uh, social media platforms, you have younger skewing population, but also just enormous reach in terms of the number of people who are on social media platforms. Digital advertising's been with us for, I would say, two decades, maybe a little more, depending on where you mm-hmm. want to put the initial marker, I guess. So it's not new, but it still feels like it's in growth mode. Am I correct in thinking that, or have the trends leveled off? It is definitely in growth mode. So uh, digital advertising and really engagement with social media platforms in general really kicked off with the Obama campaign in 2008 because there was a parallel trend where their campaign shifted to thinking about um, 
raising money as many small contributions. And prior to the beginning of this era, um, there was a much more much more of a focus on larger donations of you know anywhere from two hundred to two thousand dollars, and then you know very large donors as well. And in shifting to social media platforms, um, well, we can actually try to raise money by asking people for very small amounts, like, you know, five or $10. So that really started to grow in 2008. But at that time, digital advertising was a really small percentage of the overall ad purchases that were happening. And now, of course, it is anywhere from 30 to 50% of a campaign's advertising budget will be digital ads. And if we're saying that's still in growth mode, where might that be as the next election cycle comes around? Well, that's a question that's hard for me to answer, but I think that it will absolutely continue to grow. When it comes to voter turnout, and this is something that is a little bit different about the elections landscape compared to, you know, other applications of digital ads, young people just don't turn out as frequently to vote as older populations and the older populations are still watching TV. So there's still a dominant role for television uh, as well as other media like radio. Uh, And I think that will continue to be the case for a while, but I do also expect that, that digital ads will continue to grow. Well, if we were just talking about TV, it would be a big project, but in theory, I guess you could get a recording of every one of those DMAs and really chop it up and get some analytics on it. But when it comes to digital advertising, the fact that you have all that micro-targeting seems like researchers are blinded in a way to what's going on. What sort of data do you have to start looking at this situation? So you're absolutely right that the level of transparency from the social media platforms, it has improved, but there is still a lot that researchers are not able to see because the algorithms that they use to actually deliver these ads are proprietary. And so we have some ideas where um, the platforms are sharing information. So in the in the case of Facebook, they share delivery data. So they don't tell us how the specific ad was targeted, but we can see information about how a specific ad in in the political space was delivered in terms of the gender of the person, their age group. And we can also see information about the ad itself. Google, on the other hand, they also share some political advertising information, but they provide targeting information rather than delivery. And then Twitter has some historical data, but they've stopped doing political advertising. And so that's, you know, they're not really part of the conversation anymore. But with some uh, changes going on in leadership at Twitter, that may change in the future. So you've got a nice data set, or at least nice enough to do some actual research on. Can you talk about some of the areas you want to explore? What were the key hypotheses going in? Sure. So we gathered about 600,000 Facebook advertisements that political campaigns purchased and had delivered during the 2020 primary season. And we had a few different hypotheses that we were interested in exploring. The first is, what's the geographic distribution of these ads? And we know that political campaigns have, particularly with the, with the case of the presidential primary, that they are trying to meet some very specific goals in order to win. And one of those big ones is to raise money. We had a hypothesis that, well, if if a campaign is really trying to raise as much money as possible, we think that they would start at home, right? They would advertise to the people that know them best who are most likely to give them those small dollar doma- donations or even you know larger contributions. So that was our first hypothesis. Uh, another hypothesis we considered is whether they uh, the campaigns were really thinking ahead to um, setting up an infrastructure for the presidential race itself. And we know that in the election, the swing states or those states that um, aren't clearly Republican or Democratic are most likely to determine the outcome of the election. So we asked the question, well, 
maybe the campaigns are interested in targeting the swing states because if that particular candidate wins, then they already have this base that they can continue to advertise to that could help them in the swing states in the actual election. And then the third question we had was how might this evolve over time? We don't necessarily know the evolution, right? How campaigns are actually responding to this, you know, rapid feedback that they get from the platforms. And this is another thing that is different from digital ads in comparison to television advertisements. The campaigns can do uh, experiments and testing and get this very immediate feedback on how well their ads are doing and change their strategy in terms of, you know, where they are targeting ads and how frequently. So it seems to me any campaign is going to be an independent group. They aren't really sharing the same team of advertisers or you know people who manage the ad campaigns. Although maybe, I don't know, the parties have their experts that can help or do training. But I suspect every candidate's kind of managing their own budget, doing things their own way. Does that introduce a lot of noise to be studied? I don't know. Um, so we don't actually have visibility on who is managing the ad campaigns. But we did narrow our study to only the official campaigns that were reporting in the Facebook data set. So, for example, you have the Democratic Party and you also have PACs, you know, organizations that are raising money Mm. on behalf of a, a single candidate or a group of candidates. So in order to try to reduce the noise, we excluded the ads from parties and from PACs and we only focus on the official campaign. And we can match that data up by looking at the you know, names of the campaigns that are submitted to the Federal Election Commission. And then, so that's how we know who's an official, you know, this is the campaign of Joe Biden, for example, versus a PAC that was set up to raise money for his campaign. Well, maybe we could unpack that first hypothesis that uh, contributions will start strongest in my home state if, you know, me being the candidate, that makes total sense intuitively that I would do that. Does that play out in the data? It absolutely does. And that was one of our most interesting findings and a real change from what campaigns were doing with television. We found that the campaigns are spending the largest proportion of their digital advertising budget in their home states very early on in the process. And just to give a little background on the mechanics of the primary, the primary itself is a series of state contests. It starts in February of the election year and goes until about July. And then the party will hold a convention in August to determine who the primary winner will be. And so these state contests determine how many delegates will be allocated to each candidate. But the real campaigning actually happens in the year before those state contests begin. And what the campaigns are trying to do is raise money and also gain endorsements, get their name out, and try to top the other candidates in the polls. And so there's lots of political science research on this period called um, what we call the invisible primary. So we focused really on that time period uh, in the year before the state contests begin and during the first few state contests in order to see what was happening. It's clear from our research that this home state advantage that many candidates have because they are politicians already was really a focus of their digital ad campaign. So that was the place where they could go and raise as much money as possible. And they wanted to do that as early as possible in order to have a chance in the race. Um, The other thing that's interesting about the year we picked being 2020 is that the Democratic primary had an unusually uh, large field of candidates. So we had 26 major candidates. So in other words, candidates that actually had enough contributions to have a chance at um, becoming the nominee. So in the past years, you would see more like, you know, six to eight candidates. So to go from that range to 26 candidates, that made this invisible primary period very competitive. And the biggest strategy we saw during that period was to purchase ads in home states. 
do you get a sense of the, um, let me try and formalize what I'm trying to ask here. I guess if you put one person in charge of a $10 million budget, the only strategy for that one person is just spend as broadly as you can, you know, come up with two good ads and push it out as far and wide. But as you invest more intellectual time into that, get more and more sophisticated people to go in and do micro-targeting, the campaigns could seemingly get quite sophisticated. I don't know how we measure that exactly, but uh, you're the person I know who's been closest to the data. Do you have a sense of how sophisticated these people are? They definitely are employing a sophisticated approach. Um, In looking at just raw descriptive data from the ads, Uh, a large proportion of them appear in a single state. We really don't see a pattern of campaigns just sort of bombing all of the states at once with the same ad. Um, And so that tells us that there is definitely some strategy that's happening and some sophistication. We're not in a position to say, you know, interview the managers who are actually um, making the decisions about these ads, but we can see from the delivery statistics that they are engaging in a very targeted approach geographically and that their geographic targeting is varying over time. Well, there's the other hypothesis you'd mentioned that also seems fairly strategic and plausible to me that campaigns would target or maybe disproportionately target the swing states. I think that's exactly what I would do because... Uh, If there's a state I feel I've already won, why would I invest as much there? Uh, Does it actually play out that way? Actually, no. So um, the swing state hypothesis really didn't pan out until the very end of the invisible primary period. And so this is where you have to look at the evolving strategies over time. So because swing states are so important to the general election, we really thought that they were going to matter. But um, what we found with with this data set is that they really didn't matter until very, very late in the process. So we did see a little bit of swing state targeting um, in, I would say, the two or three months before the first state contests. But when you look at the overall effect size in terms of, you know, what proportion of their budget they're spending, it's much, much, much smaller than um, the home state targeting. And, and at that point, the campaigns become very concerned about winning the early contests in the primary. About a third of, the, of all of the delegates are allocated in, in the first few months of the primary season. And so there's um, an intense focus on, for Democrats, uh, Iowa and New Hampshire, and some of the other early contests, and then Super Tuesday, which is the first Tuesday in March. So in early on in the process where we see home state focus, and then over time we see that home state focus decline. And then as we get closer to the first contest, we see a little bump in the swing state advertising and a huge bump in advertising in the states that have early primaries like Iowa and New Hampshire. Very interesting. Do you see the candidates kind of doing that synchronously or are there early risers and and phenomenon like that? We do see the candidates do that across the board. And we used a um, regression framework to examine that both overall and over time. Could we unpack that regression a little bit? I'd love to know about some of the factors that are involved. In the regression framework, we included some control variables, things that we knew would shape how the the campaigns would allocate their advertising budget. So um, we included some state level factors. And those would be things like median income of voters in that particular state, with the idea being that, you know, you would want to target states where there are lots of wealthy voters. We also looked at Democratic turnout in those states because the campaigns will try to target where they think they can win based on voters that are more likely to turn out. We also controlled for whether a state had a caucus or a primary that ended up not being important. And then we also controlled for state-specific factors that don't vary over time. And those are referred to as fixed effects. Could you go into what a few of those are, just as examples? 
So for example, if we were to relate this to our findings, um, we found that the home state advertising was about six times greater in home states than in other states. And we found a similar magnitude of focus in states like Iowa and New Hampshire. So we can say that just overall, that the magnitude of the importance of home states is about the same magnitude as the importance of the first two races in the primary. Well, it's significant that I guess it makes sense. I do need to go raise those early campaign funds to have the momentum. Right. And our big contribution here was to show that um, that that story of, you know, raising those funds as quickly as possible um, really is is leaning heavily on digital advertising in a way that you don't see with television ads. I think you'd mentioned the regression, the, the, the home state was its strongest factor, or maybe amongst the strongest, and that uh, the primaries are playing a role there. Any other major factors that uh, get some weighting in the regression process? So um, we also looked at more specific timing. Uh, we actually broke our timing into two different variables. So we looked at primaries that were held in the month of February, those being Iowa, New Hampshire, and two others, I believe. And then we looked at Super Tuesday. There are 14 states that hold their primaries on Super Tuesday. And so that tends to be a really, really important day. And after Super Tuesday, that field of 26 candidates had whittled down to, you know, four candidates. So uh, it's a pretty remarkable time to to just go from February to March and have such a big change in the number of candidates that drop out. Yeah, absolutely. It's quite a calling, I guess. So when we co- when we compare February versus February primaries versus Super Tuesday primaries, we found that the the targeting is much stronger for the February primaries, really very little for the Super Tuesday primaries. And so that tells us that the biggest effort is happening right up until the February primaries, the first two to three primaries. And then even though Super Tuesday is something that researchers look at as a very important time in terms of spending on ads, we're not seeing that the campaigns are actually viewing it that way, because at that point, they are not spending to the same extent in those Super Tuesday states. When you think through the process, and now that we have the data, you know, you can look back at the election, it's no longer taking place, so you have hindsight's benefit. Are there any patterns of the way the campaigns conduct themselves that are predictive of success? When you say success, do you mean in the primary or in the general? Uh, well, either way, I guess it's it's ultimately, given the data set you have, it's getting through the whole process, uh, escaping the invisible primary and getting on. Yeah. So in terms of some interesting observations that we made, there were some candidates who you could group as more established candidates. So for example, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, they were all considered established candidates. And then we had some popular but not as well-established candidates like Andrew Yang, Pete Buttigieg. And we found that um, those candidates who were more established, while they did spend money in their home states early on, they did not focus as much there as the what we call long shot candidates. Those long shot candidates were more, more likely to drop out of the race, but it's interesting to us that they really spent a larger proportion of their budget on the digital ads than the established candidates did. And so that tells us that digital advertising matters and it, it certainly plays a role in how the candidates are framing themselves and um, how competitive they are. But there are definitely a lot of candidate-specific factors that are still important. And having those existing networks, um, existing financial networks, um, having um, prior experience as a, as a candidate, perhaps as, uh, as a governor or vice president in Joe Biden's case, um, that those candidate-level factors are also very important in terms of success because we could look at the primary 
of course, we only end up with one one candidate, right? right. <laughs> Early on in the primary, Joe Biden emerged as the as the candidate, and then the party, you know, participated in some negotiations to get the other handful of remaining candidates to drop out. So it's hard to measure success in terms of the actual contest, um, but we can we can look at attrition, right? So those candidates that lasted longer during the invisible primary, we can. Um, think about that as a way of measuring their success, even if they didn't ultimately get the nomination. And there are a lot of candidate-specific factors that can't necessarily be accounted for just through advertising. Yeah, for sure. I mean, these, as you said, candidate-specific factors are outside the scope of your data set. But I guess with that in mind, how significant is the, or impactful can digital advertising be? Could one of those long shot candidates have better optimized their uh, campaign and, and somehow uh, launched themselves into the presidency if they'd played their hand a little better? That is a really interesting question. And um, it's very difficult to predict you know, who is ultimately going to be the candidate that will get the nomination. We, we have learned from many studies over time that the amount of money that you raise is a key predictor. Um, but that money isn't the whole story. And a great example of that is um, we had some candidates who spent a massive amount of money on political advertising, like um, Mike Bloomberg, who spent really more than any other um, candidate spent $48 million on Facebook at the, you know, based on our data set. And he may have spent even more on other platforms. Um, Tom Steyer is another candidate who spent 30, $23 million on Facebook ads. And, you know, neither of them really were successful. Um, then you have candidates who are more established, like Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, who spent more than Joe Biden, in some cases about twice as much as Joe Biden, but still didn't get the nomination. So we know that that money matters. And in the case of some of these candidates, they can use this as a way to position themselves. So for example, Pete Buttigieg spent nearly 10 million on Facebook ads, you know, was in the running for the nomination for almost the entire invisible primary, and then ended up with a cabinet position in Joe Biden's administration. And so even though ultimately he wasn't successful in becoming president, we can think about, you know, digital advertising as part of an overall strategy, even for candidates who lose to position themselves for, to still have some political power, to still have some role of um, greater importance than, you know, or at a, at a federal level versus, you know, being a, a mayor or, um, or a governor or a state legislature, state or federal legislator. Well, having looked at the data and, and come up with some novel findings, are there any open questions you'd like to explore in the future? So we do have a number of open questions. Um, one is in thinking about the ads themselves, we have this challenge with the data where in some cases we can see delivery statistics and in other cases we can see targeting statistics. And uh, that's something that we'd really like to tease out. It's something that the you know platforms would have to make available. But if we really want to understand the strategies, then what we need is the targeting data, because the targeting data really tells us more about the behavior of the campaigns. Um, of course, the delivery is going to be highly correlated with targeting, but there is a layer of algorithmic changes that happen where the platform itself is trying to determine, you know, how it's going to make the most money in the process. And that may mean that those ads where they're delivered is a little bit different from how they're targeted. So that is definitely an ongoing question, an interesting question ethically as well, because in the past, candidates have been engaging with voters and contributors through various media, and they haven't had this layer of algorithmic delivery 
that may actually change or distort, you know, their intentions in some way. So that's something that we're definitely interested in. Another piece that is an open question is how we can think about the financial contributions in greater detail. Money and politics is certainly a very important broader topic. And this shift in the last 15 to 20 years of getting more individuals involved with smaller donations and thinking about this interaction between digital advertising and small dollar contributions that's also a very interesting question of, you know, uh, an avenue that digital advertising might influence politics as well. Um, it may be that, you know, digital advertising is able to help engage more individual contributors and actually contribute to a, a more representative democratic process. But on on the other hand, having digital ads and, you know, essentially selling where the platforms are selling information about users to the political campaigns, um, it might not be the best way to support a representative democracy. Yeah, no, I really appreciate the way you set up the dichotomy, the idea that small contributions could better reflect the true voice of all the people is an inspiring idea, but the, you know, micro-targeting and the ability for election interference to happen is the, the boogeyman in the room. I guess with these two extremes, how concerned are you personally about the impact of digital advertising on elections? Well, I am I'm actually less concerned about campaigns using digital advertising than I am about how the platforms manage communities and engagement around elections more broadly and also the extent to which they address misinformation. So when we have ads that are actually designed by politicians and their campaigns, and those ads are, you know, whether they are issue ads or requests for money or even attack ads relative to other campaigns, that information is still coming from legitimate sources in the political process. And so I'm definitely more concerned about other voices that may lead to misinformation and create problems in people's engagement in um, political issues than I am about, you know, politicians themselves actually using the platform to reach voters and contributors. Is there anywhere people can follow you online? Yes, people can find me on Twitter. My handle is nbrodnax. That's n. B-R-O-D-N-A-X. Well, great. We'll have that in the show notes as well. Nayla, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show and share your work. Thank you for having me.